were running like side by side, and like I was like running with KJ, and then all of a sudden KJ wasn't there anymore. And I turned around and <laughs> things like totally hanging down, I'm like holy shit. Like, it probably KJ hurt the scoreboard more than it hurt KJ. Honestly. Yeah. Oh, 100. percent He didn't even stop running. Like he literally like it hit him, and he like looked back to see like what it was, and just like kept going. My, my, my parents are from Buffalo, and my dad was actually oh, well, like maybe then don't. I'm about to say yeah. I might, hold on. Well, <laughs> nobody picks to be a Bills fan. You, <laughs> you just gotta you gotta be born into that thing. Dad used to tell me all the time. He used to tell me all the time, son, don't worry about the mules, just load the wagon. Hey, and welcome to another episode of Rock Chalk Unplugged, uh, our first one with the live audience. Thank you guys for coming out here today. Uh, we're here with a big guest, Hunter Dickinson. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you guys for having me. Super excited to, to have you on the team. Talk to us a little bit about uh, your, your transfer from Michigan and, and what went into your decision to, to come to Kansas. Yeah, um, once the season ended, uh, that's when I kind of you know, got um, thinking about what, what my next steps were going to be. Um, you know, I knew that I had opportunity to, you know, try to test the NBA waters. I knew I could go back to Michigan or, the, you know, the NCAA has the, you know, the transfer portal that's been a hot topic nowadays. And so um, I just felt like, you know, I needed something new. I felt like three years at Michigan, um, I did some great things, made some, made some memories there, but I just felt like I wasn't yet ready for the draft and I wanted to do one more year. Um, try to try to win a national championship and try to develop a little bit more. And so that's when I decided to enter the transfer portal um, and just try to explore new opportunities with that. What, what made you decide on Kansas? I mean, there was a lot of other schools that recruited you. Obviously, you're pretty much the biggest transfer to ever hit the portal. What made you come to Kansas? Was it your first phone call with Coach Self? Just kind of walk us through your recruiting and uh, what, what big part Coach Self and them played in it. Yeah, no, my recruiting was pretty crazy. Um, uh, when, when I first entered the portal, my phone was going nuts for a couple of days. And it, it was pretty fun, but it got old pretty quick. Um, it, it reminded me of my high school recruitment where I just couldn't wait to get it over with because, you know, you got to think about it like, you know, every, every school is calling you and every school has got like four or five coaches. I mean, Arkansas has got like 20 calling you. <laughs> Arkansas, <laughs> Arkansas, I had like 20 people calling me from them. But... Um, so yeah, you think about like six or seven schools, four coaches, that's like 24 people trying to call you like every other day. And so it, it gets a lot, but um, I think the thing that sold me about Kansas was uh, just, it, it felt like it checked all the boxes in terms of having, you know, one of the best coaches of all time present, you know, having the history and the tradition of Kansas basketball, but also him having that pedigree of developing bigs, uh, like the guy to my right. And so, <laughs> really uh, developed. And so, um, you know, I, I just feel like I checked all the boxes from that area. Um, my biggest things was I wanted to go somewhere to win. Uh, why not go to the most winningest program in all of NCAA basketball history uh, with six national championships? Um, I wanted to go somewhere to develop. As I already said, Coach Self has done great things with big men. And so I just felt like from that perspective, it just it checked all the boxes. And, and I knew wherever I went was going to be a risk because I was going to a new environment. But I felt like at Kansas, it felt like the less risk. What is uh, what does that first phone call from Coach Self look like? We talked to we talked to Kevin McCuller a little bit about that. And he uh, he gave us kind of a cool story. So what is what does that call look like from Coach? Uh, it's pretty funny because, you know, he's, he's always got that stud, I feel like. He's a um, stud. What's yeah. Up? yeah, what's up, stud? How you, you do, stud? I, I feel like I was watching one of your guys' podcasts and you talked about the feeling when he calls you a stud. You, you do feel pretty good when he calls you a stud. <laughs> it, 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 it feels a little bit different. It feels like, like, like you're pretty good or something like that. And so um, I was super excited to get that call because I knew right when I got into the portal that um, I was going to be interested in Kansas just because of, you know, watching them on TV and stuff from – I was young, and so uh, I was super happy that they were interested in me, um, and just kind of glad that you know the yeah the the, the interest was mutual. But um, he started explaining kind of his outlook and kind of his his plans if I were to go there, and um, it made me really really excited and really interested to um, kind of pursue that. What part of your game are you most excited about growing while being in Kansas, and maybe a little bit different than being at Michigan? What part of your game's gonna adapt? I, th I think just um, defensively, but also in transition. Um, I think those are the two biggest things that I've seen a big difference here at Kansas. Um, they're asking a lot more for me defensively here. Um, and I think that just goes to, you know, the style of playing the Big 12. Uh, it's a lot more up and down. And so that kind of um, refers to my thing of transition. I think I'm going to be out there running more. And I think that'll help me in my development uh, showcasing 
that I'm, you know, more versatile and stuff like that. And so that's something that I'm super excited about, super, super um, just ready to go. With the draft last night, you kind of see over the last five years, there's a trend where not as many big men are getting picked in the draft. Is, is there a certain thing that you're looking to improve on to make sure that you I mean, you're already in that conversation. You're definitely going to get drafted, but to make you rise a little bit more, is there one specific skill? Yeah, I, I think ever since my freshman year, um, I knew I would, I would, if I entered the draft, I would get at least drafted. But um, with NIL now, I think it's just, I think it's just so much smarter to come back and really improve your stock as much as you can until you're fully ready to go. And um, I think the biggest thing that they're looking for in bigs now is shooting. And so... Um, I shot 42% last year, but it was only on like 1.7 attempts a game. And so uh, one big thing that I'm going to try to do is maintain that percentage while also having a little bit more volume. But I think defensively, um, just trying to show, trying to uh, come here to Kansas, hopefully, you know, just give me a new environment and kind of showcase some different things that I wasn't able to showcase at Michigan. And so I'm just super, I guess, excited to do that and kind of try to change the narrative on um, how NBA teams see me. I think you, uh, you look at now, you've got the player of the year, uh, comes back two years in a row with Oscar coming back, to, coming back to Kentucky, and then you have Drew Timmy coming back, or not Drew Timmy, I meant uh, Zach Eady. Yeah. But you've got the player of the year coming back two years in a row. That has to be attributed to NIL, right? Like guys are, guys are going to have the ability to make really good money and support, their, support themselves and their families. Like, do you think NIL is good in, in, that, in, uh, in that perspective? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think... Uh, before NIL, like if a national player of the year was to win the award, I feel like their whole camp would try to tell them to, to leave because there's no way like you can improve on that. You're already the national player of the year. Your stock is probably at the highest it's ever going to be. But now um, with NIL, like that stock is really valued in college. Like it's if you're the national player of the year, I mean, that, that means you were the best player in college basketball last year. And so now that gives you a market. Um, and especially if your university is uh, willing to really support you and kind of um, take you in uh, for another year. I think that just makes it so much easier for guys to not have to rush their process and kind of allow them to enter the draft at their own pace, which I think is really good for the game because it makes college basketball a lot more competitive with guys staying, like guys like Zach, um, guys like Oscar, Drew Timmy, staying extra years that they probably wouldn't have without the NIL. 100%. And you've and this is be your second legend you played for. Obviously, Juwan Howard's a legend for what he did on the court, mm -hmm. being with the Fab Five, and Coach Self is a legend for just being one of the best basketball coaches of all time. I know you've only had a little bit of time with Coach Self, but is there any key differences that you've that you've noticed? Yeah, I mean, I, besides from the fact that one's like six nine and the other one's like <laughs> not that I'm not as tall. Um, I, I I really like you know playing under Coach Self. Like you said, it's only been for a couple of weeks now, but um, he definitely just seems like a guy that knows a lot about basketball. Yeah, I mean, you he can knows just tell the way he, um, he explains stuff and stuff like that, his terminology is a little bit different than what I'm used to. I mean, some things are, are universal, but some things are different. And so I'm just super excited uh, to really learn under him. Um, like I said earlier, he's one of the best coaches, not now, but of all time. And so I feel like he knows what he's doing. So if, if I'm not listening to him, then then, then that, 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 that's something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> how, uh, how have you felt in Lawrence in your first two weeks being here? What's, the, what's been the adjustment from Ann Arbor? I know Lawrence has, has got that small town feel mm -hmm. to it. What's, what's your adjustment been? I'd say it, it's pretty similar to Ann Arbor in a sense. Um, Ann Arbor's probably a little bit bigger population-wise. Uh, and in terms of a city, like the downtown was kind of reminded me of like a, not a normal city, but like gave me that feel. I mean, obviously from being from D.C., it, it's 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 not the same. It's a little bit more laid back, but I do like Lawrence. I mean, I knew I was coming. I mean, it's like it's Lawrence, Kansas. It's not Washington D.C. But I I kind of like it here. I like the slow pace and kind of laid back feel. Um, going down Mass Street. I mean, it feels like uh, this town has its own kind of you know culture and stuff like that. And I'm super excited uh, when students come back and it's um, like just the the, the town's getting bustling and stuff like that. But uh, just walking around, the people are super super welcoming. Uh, super nice. Definitely get those Midwest vibes. I yeah. feel like in Michigan, they weren't as nice. Like, they were nice people, but not as <laughs> Midwest -ish. nice. Midwest-ish, yeah. Yeah, I feel like Michigan's like a fake Midwest. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like, I think Kansas is actually like a Midwest town, but, you know, I love my time in Michigan, but um, the people here in Kansas are, are especially nice. 
Is there a goal in mind uh, for this year at Kansas? Like just one particular goal. If you could not reach any other, is there one that you absolutely want to reach? Um, I'd, I'd say winning a national championship. I think that one probably solves everything, um, especially just being at Michigan. Um, I had averaged, I think, 15 my freshman year and then like 19 the last two years. And I've seen that really doesn't that really doesn't help your draft stock as much as winning a national championship can do. Um, I, I think winning pre pretty much solves everything. And, you know, you come to a program like Kansas where expectations are always super high. It feels like this year it's almost like championship or bust with, with the roster that we have. And so um, I feel like being a, being a veteran, being a, as I've matured uh, throughout the years, I feel like with winning, uh, that, that kind of solves a lot of problems and it, it, can, it can make you um, look better than, than what you are. So I feel like winning a national championship is definitely, if, if nothing else, that would be the one goal I'd pick. Has Coach Self given you the speech about how winning the pie is big enough for everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know if he's giving you that one yet. <laughs> no, nah, he, he said that a couple times in the recruiting, and then once we got here, he's, he said it in front of the guys. Because, I mean, I think for me, like being an older guy, I, I understand what he's talking about. But for the young guys, they might not kind of totally understand what he's talking about. Um, even coming from, like, high school and stuff like that, I kind of knew when you're getting recruited, like, for AAU and stuff, my AAU team was big on winning, winning, and, like, everybody will look good instead of just having a showcase of, like, one or two guys. And I feel like Kansas is a good example of that. I mean, there's a reason why so many players get drafted because, um, you know, they're always super successful. Some guys, like, a guy like Christian Braun was on nobody's radar coming into the season, and he ends up being a first-round pick because they win the national championship. And I think that's the most perfect example of, of what he's talking about with when you win, the pie is big enough for everybody. Everybody can get drafted. Everybody can get NBA looks that sometimes might not um, have been. And that, that's, that's pretty much across the board. Like you look at, I mean, I think 2011 when Kentucky won the national championship, don't get me wrong, they had crazy talent, but what they have five first or top 15 yeah. picks or something like yeah, that. Unreal. And then Villanova did it again. So yeah, winning does solve everything. That's the speech that coach self gives to every team, <laughs> every single year. And it is natty or bust every year for us. Cause I mean, you don't want to, you, you want to end your season on a win. Yeah. We have like our horrible seasons at Kansas. Like we, we've, We've been here for the highs and lows, I feel like, oh, of, yeah. of the last decade. Um, but the horrible seasons at Kansas, you're a three seed in the NCAA tournament, you finish second in the Big 12. Like, and you go to the Sweet 16 and get beat. And, and let me tell you, like, everyone feels like the sky is falling. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, hey, you got second in the Big 12, like, you guys suck. <laughs> no, that, that, that definitely got me. That when, when he was recruiting me, and then and I'm, it was like, I'm pretty sure it was either like the Final Four National Championship game. It was like 11 p.m. at night, and he hit me with two facts that really got me. It was, I had, I've won the Big Ten, I think it was like 15 out of 17 or 15 out of 19, one of those two. And then he's like, the lowest seed I've ever been was a four. I've been a one seed 12 out of 17 years or something. Like 12, out of nine, 12 out of 19, I think it was 19. Is this is going to be his 20th? I think this is yeah. his 20th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so 12 out of 19 and then 17 out of 19. Or something crazy Unreal. like that. Oh, and, yeah, the numbers. And that got me. I was like, damn. Because <laughs> I, I had just missed the tournament. Like, my freshman year, we were number one seed. Second year, we barely made it in. We were 11 seed, um, but still we were able to make the Sweet 16. And then last year, going to the NIT, I knew wherever I wanted, wherever I was going to end up, I wanted to go somewhere where we had a shot to win it all. Um, and so when he hit those, when, when, he, when he put those statistics out there, I was like, Shoot, man. That, that's it's hard to, it's hard to, those are numbers that are hard to argue with. Yeah, no, exactly. No, so, yeah, that, that definitely got me there for sure. So, you, I mean, we already mentioned you've only been here a couple of weeks. How are those first practices like at KU? Have they been intense, or are they only intense when Coach Self's watching, or what's up with it? Um, they're definitely a little bit harder than I expected. I mean, obviously, coming into college, you know the workouts are going to be hard because it's, it's a division, high Division One program. Um, I'd say they were definitely harder than Michigan, especially at this point. Um, I mean, at Michigan, we'd even we'd even get to campus till like July one, so we you know, we we had a way more of a head start here. Um, but I remember the first couple of practices, I was so out of shape, and I felt like coming in, <laughs> I was in pretty solid shape. But now I was I needed a lot more growth in that area, and I feel like that's just coming with time, just getting more adapted to the play style and the system that we have with you know with the four game and everything like that. But um, I feel like it'll it'll only make me better. I'm super excited to be in in you know the best shape of my life, and that's something that I'm really really embracing and just trying to get better at each and every day. I do feel like 
the practices are getting easier and easier from a conditioning standpoint. But, you know, we got, we got a really good coach. And so um, I think the biggest thing that I've seen, the biggest difference is, you know, he, he really lets us play a lot. Like there's yeah. some, some shooting drills and stuff like that, but most of the practice is centered around trying to just get the ball movement, getting the, getting the ball to the third side, stuff like that, and, and just kind of really trying to get to, get to know each other playing was. And that third side is going to, by the end of July, you're just going to be like, okay, we understand. We got to get to the third side. He's going to say that a thousand times this summer. Yeah, no, I feel like, I feel like I've already, I already kind of know how to play under him. As long as you get the ball to the third side and get, get a paint touch. And get a paint touch. Um, Which is good for you because you're going to be in the paint. Exactly. Throw you the damn ball. I, I, I'll get you a paint touch. I'll get, I'll get you a paint touch. But as long as you get those two things, you're pretty good. Like, uh, I know sometimes, like, sometimes if I get a shot in a while, we'll do, we'll do a high pick and roll and one will, I mean, Juan's so good that he creates so much attention. So I'll, he'll throw it back to me, and it's a pretty wide open shot. And so I'll shoot it, but if I miss it, he'll get all mad because he didn't he didn't go to third side or didn't get a paint <laughs> touch and stuff like that. So I'm already I'm already kind of aware of kind of how to play under him. So yeah. I, I feel like that's good. Having all the new guys on the team, there's like something like nine new nine new incoming guys yeah. on the team. Like, how do you guys adjust and, and make that uh and make that connection that that comes with being at some having a group of guys together somewhere? Yeah, no, it's super crazy because, you know, being at Michigan, um, you know, we'd have like maybe three, maybe four new guys every year. And it's so it felt super comfortable every year because you, you pretty much knew all the guys that were coming in and um, obviously the, the returning players. But this year, uh, it's super unique because it felt like it feels like we've been playing with each other forever. Um, like we, we kind of clicked super fast with me and Nick and, and all the new guys, and then us just gelling with the returning players. It's, it's felt super, super seamless. It's almost you know, crazy how, how seamless it's been. It feels like, yeah, like I said earlier, we've been playing with each other forever. And I think that's really helped us on the court um, because you know, there's obviously still growing pains with um, you know, different guys like the ball in different spots. Some guys like the back cut a little bit more than others. Some will fake a dribble handoff and stuff like that. So you're still kind of trying to get to know each other and, and their habits and tendencies and stuff like that. And that's going to come with time. I mean, we have, it's only June, um, but the talent and the chemistry is already there. And I think um, that'll really help us come, you know, when it's time to win some, some tough games. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so you're, you're obviously a veteran. You're a veteran. You've played three years of college basketball, but you're in a new system learning new things. So you're kind of like an incomer. Are you ready to sit down and learn for a little bit and then become the leader and try to really digest the stuff so you can teach the younger guys who maybe don't have the brain to start picking up the, the kind of stuff that's Coach Sell's showing? Yeah, um, I, 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 I've, I've definitely felt like invigorated coming to Kansas. Uh, yeah, because I, I do feel like, you know, even though I am a vet, I, mean, I feel so old now with all these <laughs> young kids coming in. Like Marcus is 17. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, born, God. born in 06. I'm like, oh, 06. 06. I was born in 2000. I'm there. Yeah, yeah. 2000. Oh I'm still and 99. Then we, yeah, and then we had, we had camp, and these guys, kids were talking about they were born in, like, 2016. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, and I was born in 2000, so I, just, I felt so old. Oh, my gosh. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I 2016? Do, yeah, 2016. I said, what? I was like, I was like, like 2016, 2016. Was like, like 2016 was, like, two years ago. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I do feel super invigorated um, and just – really excited to learn um, being here at Kansas. It feels like it's something new. And um, yeah, like you said, there's some new terminology and I'm trying to pick that up as fast as I can. I feel like that's something that I'm pretty good with. I, I, I think I learned things uh, pretty fast. And yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm already start trying to help out the young guys because you know it can be hard, especially when you're transitioning from high school to college. I mean, you know, you're not used to practicing hard every day and having all these terminologies thrown at you. It, it can be, it can be really overwhelming sometimes, um, but yeah, for me, I'm 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 really happy to be here. Um, it's kind of like rejuvenated me in a, in a sense to where I just feel so happy coming in each and every day, getting some work in with the guys, being able to hang around them and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I'm just uh, su super happy to be there. I wanted to spin back to to name, image, and likeness, and and how much does that play into your decision, like going to KU, going somewhere else, like. When you're when you're looking at these schools and, and weighing your options, how much does that like factor in? Um, I, it, it was super funny when I was on my visit here, and that's when the rumor came out. So it was from a Michigan, it was it was from a Michigan reporter that there, like there was some contract already laid out for me here, 
And I remember my mom looked at it and she just started laughing. And, and she, I think we were at dinner and she brought it up to the coaches and were like, yeah, well, when is this part of the meeting going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> I missed out on this yeah, contract. Yeah, 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 I, I, know, yeah, I was like, yeah, this was not discussed at all. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, no, we had a good laugh about that at dinner. But, so I you mean, just had people making up numbers and, and, and oh my saying gosh. that online? or Because I, I, I would get so many texts from people t- talking about, like, oh, is this university giving you this? Like, this university gave me this. Um, even other universities were like... <laughs> But when, when that tweet came out, other universities started getting super nervous because they were like, is, is this real? Like, is this real? <laughs> I was like, no, uh, this, 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 this never happened. But, um, I mean, it, it's obviously like NIL is obviously a thing. But for me, um, my main goal was obviously to try to be an NBA player. And that was kind of the driving force in my decision. Um, you know, whenever any, any coach asked me, like, so like, what are you looking in for a school? Like, what are you looking in? A school like what do you want to see from the school and my main two things are always I want to win a national championship and I want that school to develop me to try to be an NBA player um, and I was never in that top two and so I think it got overblown because some comments I might have made on my own podcast that you know might have like <laughs> might have kind of exacerbated what I was trying to say just from an NIO standpoint of what I feel like I was what I didn't get at Michigan but um I mean, like, like I said earlier, it has a part in college athletics nowadays, but for me, I just always want to try to keep the main thing the main thing, and that's trying to develop as best I can under Coach Self and just trying to help my team win a national championship. It's kind of crazy how much like media spins things to make, to make you like, be like, oh, I didn't get this, or I'm, I'm going to get this. Like, yeah. I feel like they, they take your words and construe them in a way that's just going to get clicks for them. Yeah, that's, a, that's the one thing. I, like, Twitter is like the craziest thing ever because it's like – it just gives people a voice. Like you can, Joe Schmo can go make a Twitter account and hide behind a screen with like a fake Instagram or a fake profile picture and really say whatever he wants. Like I swear, when I was back at Michigan, like if I like saved a baby from like a burning house, <laughs> some Michigan State fan would be like, okay, why didn't you save two? Like that's, like, the, stuff, that's hey, the stuff that happens. Hey, but, wait till you meet Kansas State fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 no Michigan time. State yeah. fan. <laughs> but you know, I think like that. That twist and like you can have a whole. I remember on my podcast, like I would talk about a player and, and, and compliment him for like a minute, but then I would say like some about oh, but like his shot isn't that like his shot isn't that good, and like somebody would take literally Hunter Dickinson says quote unquote his <laughs> shot isn't that good, and that's like the whole quote they would run with, and everybody would believe that, and oh, I, this was the funniest thing ever. So on April Fools, somebody took like a quote. Or somebody took like a 30 second video of my podcast and it had no volume on it. And they just like quote tweeted the whole thing saying like I was saying something bad about, I think it was Jet saying like he's a ball hog, blah, 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 blah. And people actually bought it. Like, I'm like, there's no, there's no sound. Like, you can't, you can't even hear anything in the video. But like, I would just, I saw the comments there like, oh my gosh, how could he say that? He just left them and he's saying that. I'm like, these people are just so clueless. But I mean, that, that's social media nowadays. That's why. Some of this stuff, like, it can just get overwhelming. That's why a lot of people are saying, like, oh, I, I stay off social media. And that's probably a good thing because there's, there's, it's easy to find bad things. If you're looking for something negative about yourself, it's very easy to go on Twitter and find that. So it can definitely be toxic and, and kind of bad for, for your mental health. And so I, I definitely <laughs> – having a podcast on my own has definitely helped me because back, like, freshman year, especially in high school, like, I would try to look at those comments and, and get a little bit upset. But – Having that podcast now, I could not care less about what somebody says. About yeah, Twitter. yeah. I, I, I think any fan base, you're gonna have, yeah. you're gonna have the trolls that are gonna come out. You have one bad game, you, you, you miss a free throw, like you, people are gonna come out and troll you, like no matter what. Like it's, it's, oh. it's part of it. There's way more good fans than there is trolls. So. But the trolls just, they end up tweeting the most. Yeah, yeah. they do definitely tweet the most. They got Twitter fingers. Oh my gosh! Like uh, I remember freaking, we played Illinois and on. This this does still hurt me to this day that we never actually beat Illinois in my career there in Michigan. But I remember my last game, I had like 31 and 16, and, and Illinois fans were in my comments talking about some like, you suck. I'm like, I just had 31 I and killed, 16. I, I, I killed your team, sorry. <laughs> I, I did all I could out there. But. So let's bring this back a little bit to more to the Kansas uh, side of things. How much of a role, or have you been to a game in Allen Fieldhouse? No, I was actually just talking to somebody right before this, and you know, I said I've never been there. Um, I've heard so much about it. I remember Jay Bills um, talking about you know Allen Fieldhouse being probably the mecca of college sports. 
um, in basketball. And, and that's, it's always been a bucket list. I remember at Michigan, I was telling guys like, yeah, like I would always love, like after I'm done, like Allen Fieldhouse would probably be a game that I'd want to go to, um, you know, before it's all said and done. That's crazy how things work now that I'll be playing there a lot now. Um, but I'm super excited uh, to play in there. I can just, I remember on my visit, just walking in there and just seeing like, yeah, I could definitely tell this place gets crazy. But I, the the old feel feels like I'm like almost like in the in the Hoosiers or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and so I yeah I've, I've actually wa- looked up videos on YouTube of Allen Fieldhouse and just like the craziness just to because I can't wait. That's how excited oh, I am. Yeah, like, I I, I'm looking up videos of of the crowd and how, how loud it gets before the games because just because I know like Kansas fans are so crazy about uh, Kansas basketball and that's. That's what, that's why I came here is to be able to play in front of those fans and try to try to win some games in front of them. And you just talking about Allen Fieldhouse made me and Mitch giddy. There. <laughs> I know, so like, like, yeah, like, let's place. go back. Let's go back. <laughs> that place we, is so we were talking, fun to play in. We were talking about this the other night. Like you're getting ready to play Fort Hayes State in one of our exhibition games, and you're sitting in the locker room, and the locker room's shaking because there's sixteen thousand <laughs> people there getting ready to watch you play a D two school. Like there's no other place in the nation where that's going to be going to be the case. Yeah. Like it's and, absolutely absurd that we. Fill out that place each and every night, like. Oh yeah, and yeah, and sell out in like how many straight years? Like you ne- never had. Oh, not yeah. a I don't know the number. It I got to the point has where said, like uh, for his entire career they've had one. Yeah, the number is too big to even keep track of it. It's just a really, really long streak. It's, <laughs> it's special. Like there's like really no other way to describe it because like you go out there and no, besides KJ's incident, it's really a really yeah. fun time. Yeah, KJ had the the back or the scoreboard. We ran that? out the tunnel. It dropped down and I, smacked. I, I, heard that. I heard about that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, and I'm running like we were running like side by side, and like I was like running with KJ, and then all of a sudden KJ wasn't there anymore. And I turned around and things <laughs> like totally hanging down. Like holy shit! I could totally see like people hitting their heads because you know you guys have to jump to like and slap the hands and everything. It's because people are like the fans are slapping it. the board at the top, and it, really, they oh, like, oh, okay. they were slapping and so. Like, it, See now I'm now I'm gonna be scared when I'm running out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be. Of course, sure KJ though, there. KJ being like the, the tough guy he is, like he's just, the thing like drills him. Like that would have. Like, it probably it probably hurt concussion for me, KJ. Like, it probably hurt KJ, the scoreboard yeah. more than it hurt KJ. Honestly. Yeah. Oh, 100. percent He didn't even <laughs> stop running. Like he literally like it hit him, and he like looked back to see like what it was, and just like kept going. And he had this huge knot on his forehead and everything. And that it was, probably like, just energized nothing. him for the game. That was like his like pre-workout before the game. Oh, that probably sad. was. <laughs> but uh, Chris, you. Should we open it up to Q&A now? Yeah, let's open it up to the let's, Q&A. Let's do it. Awesome. So I know you guys have like, talked about it on previous podcasts about your like, welcome to KU moment. So, Hunter, what has been your welcome to KU moment? <laughs> when did you kind of realize you know, it was real here? I'll be honest. I don't think I've had that yet. Uh, it still feels surreal that I'm here. Um, I mean, it, it, I, I still I, – I talked to, I think, Nick about this either yesterday or the day before. It still feels like I, I'm not here yet. Um, I think that will probably happen – um, maybe when we're in Puerto Rico, but definitely by like the first day of school and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it, it still feels crazy that I'm here uh, wearing, you know, the Jayhawk and stuff like that. Um, it, it's something that I wasn't expecting, um, but it, it, it's just so crazy that I get to say I play for the University of Kansas. And you'll, have, well, you'll have a welcome to KU. I, I was getting ready to say it's, it's boot camp one day. Yeah, oh, I was yeah. literally going to say that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that, that's probably yeah, yeah that probably happened. <laughs> I too. wonder if you guys are going to do it early this year because you're going to Puerto Rico. Like, or is he just going to do it after you get back? Yeah, from you Puerto don't. Rico? Yeah, you, want, you don't want that to that. happen. Yeah, I hope we save that for for a little bit. All right, one more. What did you guys think about Grady's outfit last night? Oh, God. Uh, I know Grady pretty well. So, like, I know it was, like, a half joke, half seriousness. So, like, it was kind of like, okay, that's funny. But if he was being completely serious about it and then him saying all the Dorothy stuff, Dorothy from Kansas. Yeah, was, that, that was so <laughs> cap. You try, bro, you, try, you try to bring that in there. That was so cap. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely no way in hell I'd ever be seen. Like, he's got to have so much confidence to wear that, though. Like, Oh, yeah. That is, like, the most – one of the better fits I've seen – that draft night. What would your draft night fit be? It depends. I mean, if I'm if I'm Grady Dick and I'm going to be a top fifteen pick, yeah, you know, you, got, you can throw you can show up in whatever. <laughs> I, I, uh, don't let me be a top fifteen pick. I might show up, <laughs> I might show up in something crazy. Um, no, I, I liked it. I mean, like like you said, you got to have some confidence to wear that. I feel like that spoke about. I think Grady's somebody who doesn't lack. Um, no, he lack doesn't. confidence at all. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> but the the suit and the color of the suit could have matched. Couldn't could not have matched the team any perfectly. Oh, yeah. It was like it was like 
picture perfect that he was going to the Raptors. And so um, happy for him, and, and I feel like that's a good fit for him there. Um, what would you say, what are a couple of sayings that you kind of live by as you've gone to me about an incredible journey in your life and get to this point? Like, are there a few things that you always come back to or reflect on as you're putting in work? Yeah, um, I think, you know, one of the biggest things is um, like w w when, when tragedy happens and stuff like that to the people you know and how quickly the game can be taken away from, from guys that you know. Um, you know, one day you're playing and the next day, you know, your career is over. I think that always motivates me, uh, just knowing that you never know when, when, when your time is done with this game. You know, it could be 10, 15 years from now, it could be a year from now, it could be, you know, the next time you go out there. And so that not knowing, um, you know, when the last time you're really going to pick up a basketball kind of motivates me, I feel like, to try to go out there and just give it my all each and every day. Um, one saying that, um, I picked up from Michigan that I, I try to live by is that 1%, getting 1% better each and every day uh, because it makes stuff way more tangible and, and way more achievable. If you think about it, you know, a lot of guys will try to get exponentially better in a day, and that can be kind of hard sometimes to measure. But if you're only trying to get 1% better each and every day in something, um, that's something that's really achievable. And that 1%, if you do that enough and stack it enough, stack it enough each and every day, um, that 1% turns into 2, turns into 4, 10, 12, and then you're eventually getting 100% better. Um, and that's something that I definitely try to live by because it, it makes it really achievable and something that you can go, go out there each and every day with that mindset and, and you're going to get better. Mitch, you got one? Me? Yeah. Well, what I live by? Yeah. Uh, shoot, my dad is like the captain of quotes. Like, he, <laughs> like I'll wake up to a new quote from my dad like each and every day. I'm like, Dad... I'm not even playing right now. Like, <laughs> I appreciate it, but this podcast is about to be great today. Um, uh, I was his. My favorite one from him is "No what ifs." Like you don't want to live a life of, of wish I could have or should have could have would have. Like that's leave no stone unturned, and and uh, that's kind of what I, I I base up my career off of. Is like I was gonna stick it out at Kansas for. A decade, and I was going to stick it out of Kansas for a decade. Like yeah, I, I was going to make sure it. I got the most out of that situation, <laughs> and uh, thank God it ended with uh, it ended with the most important win of them all. So yeah. that was that's my uh, my quote. And I, I mean, I have one from Coach Self as well, and I know Mitch will. You'll hear this at some point. You'll probably hear it like fifteen. Probably 20 already. Times he's probably year. already heard it. <laughs> but it's the it's the hills and valleys, not the mountains and canyons. You want to live your life on hills and valleys. So you can go high and you can go low, but you never want to go up to the top in that emotion. You never want to go all the way down to that emotion. You want to live your life in that little. In that little, hey, I can show my emotion, get get whatever, but there's never a time where I feel super satisfied in what I've done, and there's never a time where I'm super down on myself not thinking there's anything. You want to live in that hill and that valley, not at the top of that mountain or the bottom of that canyon. Yeah, that, was prof that was really profound. That's a good one. <laughs> That's, I love that one. There you go, Chris. I think about that one pretty often, actually. <laughs> hey, after coming from the Big Ten, you've obviously played in some tough environments. You think that his own in Michigan State, uh, Assembly Hall, Bloomington, Carver Hawkeye Arena. Now looking forward into the Big 12, what are some of the environments you're excited to play in uh, as Kansas is always the most hunted team? Yeah, that's, that's one thing about, you know, playing for the University of Kansas. Uh, it feels like, you know, you're every, every team Super Bowl, and so it feels like every, every arena you go to is going to be sold out and crazy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to go to Kansas was because I, I want that target on my back. I want a team's best shot. Um, and, and I feel like there, there's nothing better than uh, being a team that gave you their best shot because that really shows that, you know, you're, you're superior to them. Um, and... I haven't really thought about you know opponents too much. Um, still trying to learn all the opponents in the in the Big Twelve. Honestly, uh, if I had to name them all right now, it might take me a second here. I might There's some new ones though too. So yeah, well the new ones actually no. Um, I'd I'd uh, I'd say for personal reasons Cincinnati. I would love to play there and beat them. Kentucky. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, we, well yeah. Well, we well. We, we don't play at Kentucky. I, would, I definitely do want to play them because uh, I lost to them last year in London, and so that's definitely a game that I'm excited to play. But um, if anything, I, I'd say like the, the home games too, like UConn. I know we played Missouri. I know that's a big rivalry here that big I'm still trying to learn. Um, 
depends on how you look at rivalry. We've won by like thirty the last like four times. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. We give them, a, we give them a spanking. Yeah, but I mean, like the rivalry, uh, rivalry between, <laughs> between, the, between the fan bases. I'd say. <laughs> rivalry between the fan bases, and so I'm still trying to get to learn all that stuff. Uh, but uh, I am biased to the Big Ten. I, I am super excited to go back to Bloomington and play Assembly Hall because I know how crazy that is, and that'll be a really fun game because they should be pretty good as well. Um, and so that that game is definitely one that I cannot wait to play. Who is your favorite KU basketball player of all time? Christy. No, yeah. me, no, you, you, it's just um, your question. You can answer me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> For me, growing up uh, watching Kansas basketball, um, there's there's three people that – I remember, um, I'd say it's between Cole Aldridge and yep. then the Morris Twins. I think I just remember the Morris Twins playing uh, Kansas, but maybe Cole Aldridge because you know he kind of he's a big white guy, so, <laughs> so, so I'd say probably Cole Aldridge maybe. Chris, what about you? Me, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I won't include anybody I played with. Obviously, Ochai Abaji was a. I mean, great dude on and off the court, won us a national championship, or we contributed on it, but he pretty much carried us to get him out of the way that year. Um, Devontae Graham's another guy everybody loves for a very, very good reason, but I have a bias when my brother played. My favorite player was Thomas Robinson. Like, if you said something bad about Thomas Robinson, like, I was up in arms. I was getting <laughs> I forgot about Thomas Robinson, yeah, because he's from my area, so. Oh, yeah. Damn, I, uh. If I can change my answer, I'll go Thomas Robinson. Yeah, no, he was a dog, too. He was, he was. so fun to watch. And his story, too, and everything. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I was like, I'm not going to lie to you. I was probably going to say T-Rob, but I go Jeff Withy. I like Jeff Withy. Jeff Withy's a good yeah, one, He's a pretty good one. I feel like Jeff Withy was like him and Perry Ellis. I, th I think Kansas maybe is just the university where guys just stay forever. You got you. It feels like. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> it feels like Jeff Withy was there forever. It feels like, I mean, Perry Ellis. I think he's, I feel like he's going to come back and still be, you know, <laughs> his locker like right next to me, like he's going to play another year or something like that. But yeah, those guys have been here for a long time. Sure. People don't want to leave. Yeah, there's a reason. There's a reason people don't want to leave Kansas. We uh, we got one up here, from Chris. Uh, what has it been like going from Michigan, where you were definitely the number one, maybe even sometimes the number one and number two scoring option? to a team like KU that has three returning starters and two of them are the same age or older than you in the forward Yeah, um, it's definitely been a transition. Um, being at Michigan, it kind of, it was like, yeah, I know everybody knows to kind of give me the ball every time. Um, but here at Kansas, it's been, it's been super fun because it, re it kind of reminds me of back when I was playing AAU uh, with, my, with my AAU team when we had, uh, our starting lineup was Duke, North Carolina, North Carolina, Villanova, and Michigan. That was our five, and so that was pretty a pretty talented starting five, and uh, we were able to share the ball a lot. Um, there were some games when you'd go off for 18. There were some games where you only get eight, and I feel like that that might happen this year with with a couple of the guys where um, our scoring might be a little sporadic, just because of the amount of talent that we have. Um, I think Coach Self has has kind of put an emphasis on on giving me the ball a little bit. Um, because he's, he always says he loves throwing the ball to big guys, and and that's something that was a big reason why I came here is because I know, you know, he, he does love his big guys. But um, our team is so talented that I think there will be a lot of nights where we have a a, a different um, high score, and I think that's something that'll make us really really difficult to stop and make us so good. This is uh, something we talked about with DeWan. It wasn't we didn't it wasn't on the podcast. It was kind of something behind the scenes. But we were like, if you were, like pitch. Pitch KU to Hunter, like, what would you do? And he was like, you will get the ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I will give you the ball every time if you want it. Like, come to KU. <laughs> so that was, it was pretty funny because I was like, I wish we could have shown you that before. But yeah, thank God was, you ended up here, though. Yeah. yeah, it was before you committed, and we cut that part. They, were, they didn't like that we had him say that. Because we, we had him give you a whole pitch. And he was like, yeah, dude, you'll average 30 points. I swear to God. I will, I will pass you every time. <laughs> that don't sound too bad. That don't sound too bad. We'll do a couple more here. I have one because I heard you were the high school mascot. Yeah. Back in the day. Um, I'm curious. <laughs> you probably know we have the baby J and big J. Any interest in giant J? <laughs> <laughs> I I do it. Um, yeah. No. I, because being at Dematha, um, I was the student body president. 
uh, my senior year. And I, I'm, I've, I've always been big on like school spirit and stuff like that. Um, even in high school, going to, you know, all the other sporting events and then coming to Michigan, going to different sporting events. Just being out in the community is something that, you know, I've always liked to do, just showing my face. Um, and so, yeah, no, if they if they request it, I'll, I'll, I'll say yes for a game. <laughs> I feel like I feel like they know who the mascot is if I, if I got in there. But, um, yeah, but, but yeah, no, I'd, I'd be open for it. It was good in the winter, though, because it would be, like, at the math, it would be – We'd be playing football games in like November, and it gets kind of cold. It's probably like forty degrees, and you're in that mascot thing. You're you're all warm and, <laughs> and insulated in that thing. Uh, since you've been here, since you've been here and uh, since practice has started, which player have you found is pushing you and the rest of the guys hardest in practice? Um, I think the one that's probably pushed everybody is El Marco. Um, being a freshman, um, I didn't. I wasn't really too familiar with this game. Because uh, I don't know, nowadays it's so hard to keep up with guys. But he's been somebody that's really surprised me uh, just with his talent and then also with his potential. Um, I mean, I think Coach Self said in one of the practices that he has the potential to be, you know, one of the best prospects on the team. And, um, you know, he's been super good for us in practice. He's, his ability to score, um, his ability to change directions. Um, I think, you know, if, if he tines up his shooting, I think um, he'll definitely hear his name called. Um, in, in, in some NBA draft soon. So I think that's one player that's really surprised me so far. Hey, when you mentioned that third side earlier, I, of course, know what that means, but for the people that... that <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the first side is, is the strong side. So if you're on the basketball court, you cut it in half. Uh, the side with the ball usually has another two players, usually one on the block or in the dunker spot, which is in the short corner, and then there's probably another guy in the corner. So that's the strong side because it's got three, and then the weak side is over there with the two. So if you go from the strong side to the weak side, that's the second side, and then back to the third side is, is the strong side. So it's really just a, a term to get the ball moving. Um, he also likes a term called getting it flat, which is yeah, getting it to the corner. So you get it to the corner, get back up, get, get it back to the third side. Um, just kind of, it's an easy term to basically just say get the ball moving because um, some coaches would be like, just get it moving, get it moving. It might stick to one side. Like that's a big thing they emphasize is, you know, don't pass it to where it came from because you're not really making the defense move that much. So if you go from side to side, down, down, side, side, you're really making that defense work and trying to just make them make a mistake and, and try to capitalize off that. Coach Self's big thing is like give the defense a chance to break down. Yeah. It's like, if if you're staying playing one on one, then everybody else is built in help side. You're having to beat not only your man but two other guys that are they're gonna try and pick you up as soon as you beat your man. So yeah. it's big on he's he's really big. You know, probably yell at, get to the third side a million times this year. Yeah. yeah, the third side may not be as much after summer ends, but the get it flat you it's, will hear that until probably after the national championship. Like you will stop playing for him for a couple of months, and he'll yell at you get it flat. You're gonna or be something. in the NBA, <laughs> and like you're gonna be in an arena in like five years, and then. You're going to hear somebody go, get it flat. And you're going to look, and there's Bill Self. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's always like, get, get the ball humming, get the ball humming. <laughs> uh, so you've been asked a lot of great basketball questions. Um, I'm more curious what uh, Coach Self has told you about the basketball game that you most enjoy playing. Um, and then I guess you could ask this to Casey. Because I saw you at Loki's during your visit. So I'm just curious. Okay, it wasn't you? Casey. <laughs> <laughs> this? Yeah, um, What's it, it wasn't him. I don't know who that was. <laughs> well, they were just trying to show me different places in Lawrence. To get That's good a restaurant now, too. Yeah, Logan, this is a restaurant. Hey, it's I a restaurant. I quesadillas. It's really good. quesadillas are pretty good. No, they actually. are really good. And some tater tots. Um, they've, yeah, got a good, they've got a good burger at the wheel. It's got, well, got I, I, haven't, I haven't been. I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to explore Lawrence. So I feel like I haven't been everywhere. We'll, um, tell you, we'll take you to the wheel and get you a Wayne burger. <laughs> I, I got to go to... Um, I saw on Twitter this one place called... Uh, with the wings, Jefferson's. Oh, Jefferson's. Jefferson's. You've been Jefferson's? Jefferson's? Yeah. No, no, I gotta go there. Double dipped to. wings. Yeah. Double dipped wings. Really? Way to go! Oh my God, they're unreal. Because I'm my, unreal. my my parents are from Buffalo, and my dad was actually oh, well, like maybe then don't. I'm about to say yeah. Hold on. <laughs> well, well, yeah, because no, because oh, yeah, I, I do have high. That's ex, a lot to live up to. I do have high expectations for wings because my dad actually um, worked in like a like a pizza wing joint. No way. And so he like kind of knows how to make the chicken wings and the sauce and everything. So I do have high expectations, but. 
I do love me some good wings. I, even though I'm, you know, I'm trying, trying to cut and lose some weight a little bit, I, I still enjoy some wings from time to time. So. I'll, I'll, show sure, some, I'll show you some good wings around. I got a great place. Okay, good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I need that. Okay, I got a question. Uh, I learned earlier you're a Bills fan. Yeah. Oh, Are God. I decided to have to... Uh, played the Chiefs. <laughs> the I didn't know I didn't that. Well, I, I said my my parents are from Buffalo, and so, it, um, you know, being a Bills fan, I feel like it's passed down. Nobody picks to be a Bills fan. So you, gotta be, <laughs> you just gotta you gotta be born into that thing. Um, but nowadays, know, there's a lot of bandwagoners though for the Bills, though. I feel yeah, like. now, well, now it's kind of trendy because we got Bills Mafia. You know, everybody loves like jumping through tables and stuff like that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Now it's kind of a little trendy. But the Bills have had success with the Chiefs in the regular season, so I'm not worried about that. Now, the playoffs, on the other hand, that's where – that's where, I mean, the Bills kind of, like, make or break my week in the falls. Like, if they lose on, on a Sunday, I might, be, I might be in a mood for a couple of days. <laughs> and so I, I, am, I am excited to go to that game. Hopefully, hopefully I can buy – hopefully I can find, like, a suite or something so I can be away from everybody and not – because I'm going to be in my Josh Allen jersey. I got my red Josh Allen jersey. So I'm going to have that on. Hopefully I can be in a suite or something and be kind of away from everybody so they won't give me crap for it. Chris Just and like, I went to a game last year – or no, two years two ago. ago yeah. Time flies. But uh, we went to a game two years ago, and uh, the Bills ruined our, uh, ruined our, our weekend. Yeah. yeah, and then we had two days the next morning. Yeah. It was a good we, time. We, uh, we were like, all right, we're going to sacrifice. We're going to go to the Bills-Chiefs game. We're going to watch a win. It'll be great. I no, remember, yeah, I we lost, and then we had two days the next well, day. Well, and there was an hour and a half rain delay, but you did just lose. Oh, I remember. No, I, wasn't that like lightning? Yeah, yeah. I remember that. We, we were at that game the whole time. Oh, we were soaking wet that was, that was in the one. rain yeah, and lost. That Seven a.m. practice. That didn't Ooh. start back up to like eleven thirty. Yeah, I thought they were just gonna postpone it, but yeah. Coach Shelf's like, you guys, you guys went to the game. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, all right, get on the line. Let's practice. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, it was a rough morning. <laughs> If you could explain why, Chris. Uh. Uh, well, we were just out super late, and I was kind of half asleep when I got home. That uh, I, when I woke up the next morning, going to our 7 a.m. practice, and I backed out of our house in oh. Lawrence, and I took my whole side mirror off too. So it was that like was I, I was having a great <laughs> two days. <laughs> I'm in the passenger seat, and all I hear is like crunch. It takes off the window drain on the side of our oh. house. Yeah, that was a great day to be Chris T. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Profound questions? Anyone? Well, perfect. We, we can wrap it. Thank you all again for being here. And thank you so much, Hunter, for doing this. And, and everybody, Rock Shop Unplugged. So again, throw a follow. I, this is a cool experience. And this is what we're hoping to do is more experiences like this where we can connect the fans and the athletes and, and just hopefully have some fun along the way. So round of applause for Hunter. And thank you so much. Way to go, Hunter. Round of applause for you. <laughs>